everybody. I'd like to welcome each and every one of you to the virtual path today. And as you can see, I'm solo this morning, but I am so excited to be here because we are in week two. That's right, week two of our Blockbuster Summer Series. And today is a special day. Who can tell me what today is? Huh? Huh? Well, it's Father's Day and it's Juneteenth. Now, if you don't know what Juneteenth is, Juneteenth is the day that we commemorate because the last enslaved Africans were officially released by Union soldiers on June 19th, 1865, effectively a couple years after the Emancipation Proclamation. And so today, I think it's special that we get to celebrate Father's Day and Juneteenth while we're watching a movie. And so I wanted to uplift a question to you all. What quality, what admirable quality do you find the most in the father figure in your life? Go ahead, put it in the comments. What admirable quality do you find the most in your father figure in your life? I mean, I, I love the fact that here in this church, I have so many father figures, but I also am grateful for my father, Terry Vick. I mean, he has so many qualities that I admire, but the thing that I love the most about Terry is just how compassionate he is, how loving he is. I mean, I'm 34 years old, and yet I know if I call him right now with anything, he'd be there. And so I'm grateful that I get to see that in my dad. I get to see that in the men in this church. And even thinking about it, I was reflecting, and last year, me and one of my best friends, Quay, did a, we did a little Father's Day skit. But guess what? This year, he is now a father. So I just want to shout him out. I know he's at home changing diapers and enjoying watching his son, Kamari, for his very first Father's Day. And so I just want to say happy Father's Day to you and to all of the new fathers and the fathers who have been in the game for a long time. And so today for week two of our Blockbuster Summer Series, I am going to be doing a movie about black fatherhood, about hope. Matter of fact, that's the name of my sermon, Audacious Hope. And the movie is Pursuit of Happiness. You know, I'm excited to share what God has given me, y'all. But before we even get into that, let's go over to our Path Kids song. Yeah. 
thanks, Path Kids. Really appreciate you. And so this, this is the time in our service where we give. We talk about what it means to give to God. And 1 Chronicles 29, 14 says this, But who am I? And who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you and we have given you only what comes from your hand. And this is a powerful scripture when it comes to what it means to come together and to give because it allows us to recognize that everything that we have comes from God. And so as we give from what God has given us, we're able to continue together to give to others. And so there are a couple of ways to give here on the virtual path. You can text the path one word to 77977 or you can go to our website www.thepath.church and you can click the give option there. And so as we get to give, let's go to God in prayer. God in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for the ways that you move. Thank you for giving to us so much. God, I pray as we move through this service, as I preach your word, that you will give me the words to say. God, I pray as we give of our substance that we are able to come together to help others and to mobilize others to know you better. And God, I pray for those who have recently had to go through loss. God, I pray for Ariana. I pray for Jordan as they have lost family members. God, I pray that you will be the God of all comfort that comforts them. God, I pray that you will allow us to be comfort to them as they navigate the grief process. And God, ultimately, I pray that we can be your light, your salt in a dark and dying world. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have a couple of announcements. Uh, we have our Better Than Expected t-shirts online. As you see here, this is the choral option. Uh, also, we have Wake Up Wednesday. Every Wednesday, we have someone who is able to share some insights for us on hump day. As always, we have our small groups. And then next week, next Saturday, we have our men's breakfast. And I love these men's breakfasts because it really gives us space and opportunity as men to come together, different ages, different stages in life to just talk, to eat, to worship, and just to love God together. And so I hope if you're a man watching this right now, you'll join us at our building at 745 Bolton Road in Atlanta, Georgia. And now we'll have a song from our music ministry and I'll be right back with the sermon, Audacious Hope.
Good morning, everybody. <laughs> I'm back. But like I said earlier, I'm so glad to have you with us on the virtual path, tuning in on this Father's Day and Juneteenth. It's a special honor and privilege to be able to stand here, here in the second week of Blockbuster Summer, where this special day means so much to me. I mean, as a father, the day means much to me, and concurrently as the descendant of enslaved people, the significance isn't lost on me. I mean, I must admit, I've known I was preaching on this day for a while, and so in full disclosure, I was beyond knee-deep in a sermon about the power of freedom and what it looks like when we've been freed mentally, spiritually, emotionally, and physically, Matter of fact, I even contemplated wearing a dashiki, some jeans, shorts, and some grilling sandals just for the culture. Y'all know the ones I'm talking about, the grill master fives with the little sport action and art support. Y'all know what I'm talking about. But you see, his angel did a great job kicking off Blockbuster Summer with Encanto last week. I was reminded that we have entered our series where we try to use movies in order to convey biblical truths. I mean, if you know me or any other preacher, you know we love movies. You know we love things that engage our imaginations and ways that we're able to think deeply about the implications of the messages through the movies. And so in Blockbuster Summer, the hope is that we're able to have some fun. The hope also is that we're able to plant some seeds via unconventional means so that everyone has an opportunity to connect with the truth of the gospel. As communicators and lovers of scripture, we want to do our best to make the biblical text come alive in a way that honors God and edifies, equips, and empowers God's people. And so with that being said, I was racking my brain to figure out how I would shift in order to incorporate Juneteenth, Father's Day, and movies. I mean, I was taking recommendations from friends. I went from Black Panther to Lean On Me to Boys in the Hood to 42 and John Q. But suddenly in the last week, I recalled a movie from 2006 about black fatherhood, The Pursuit of Happiness. If you haven't seen it, it's a movie starring Will Smith that's based on an autobiography by a man named Chris Gardner. And in the movie, we're introduced to the main character, Chris, and Chris is a dreamer. He's a man who's determined to be the best possible dad at all costs, who takes risks and get an opportunity that would change the trajectory of his life and the life of his child forever. And so as I began to think about the themes in the movie and even what challenges exist for fathers in our own day and age, I thought about the story of another father, a father in scripture who had to take risks, 
who had to overcome resistance and ultimately reaped a reward. The father is known to many of us as Father Abraham. You know, for all of the summer VBS kids, we sang this song. Father Abraham had many sons and daughters. Sons had Father Abraham. You know, when I was a kid, that was probably one of the most fun songs I could sing because we were marching in place for whatever reason. But well before Father Abraham had any sons and daughters, he had an opportunity. An opportunity that we see in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. And so that's our text for today and our time together. But before we jump in, let's go to God in prayer. God in heaven, we thank you for the ways that you move, the ways that you engage us, the ways that you equip us, the ways that you empower us. God, in this moment in our time, I pray that I'm able to say what you want me to say. Stop me from saying anything you don't want me to say. And God, ultimately, I pray that you will be glorified and your people will be edified. We love you. And we're praising your son, Jesus name. Amen. Genesis chapter 12. And I'll be reading from the NRSV version, starting in verse one. It says this. Now the Lord said to Avram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you, I will curse. And you all, the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Avram went as the Lord had told him and Lot went with him. And Avram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Avram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran. And they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. And when they had come to the land of Canaan, Avram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land but then the Lord appeared to Avram and said to your offspring, I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. As we begin to dig into this passage, we see that God has given Avram a specific command with rewards. But it was necessary in all of this for Avram to exercise audacious hope. And so while we're talking about pursuit of happiness, we, we're talking about what it looks like to have audacious hope. You see, I believe that this type of foresight and hope was what God had in mind for Avram. The passage tells us that God spoke and Avram listened. God said, go and gave Avram a list of promises. But I want to draw our attention to some things. See, if you're not familiar with the story of Avram, I'm saying Avram, but we may read it as Abram. The biblical record tells us that he was from the Ur of the Chaldeans. The archaeological and scholarly record tells us that he might have lived in the Middle Bronze Age. And we surmise from the information that we have that he was from southern Mesopotamia. And so we have a man who leaves his home, but he's with his father and they travel to Haran. He was with his wife named Sarai, his nephew, that we know as Lot. He had servants, but no kids. And in fact, he and his wife couldn't even have kids. And so they have their own challenges, their own frustrations and their own insecurities. And in the midst of all of that, God calls him to step out even further. And he calls him to a risk. And that's my first point this morning. One four letter word, R-I-S-K, risk. Why was it a risk? You see, many times it's easy to put our Western eyes, Protestant perspectives and empirical insights on the text and miss that we're reading a narrative that was first passed down orally. And then it was written down to be made sense of in a Near Eastern world. Avram came from a place that did not revere Yahweh as we understand God. You see, some scholars believe that Torah, his father, was possibly Hindu or Zoroastrian. We don't know. But we know that he believed in God's in a way that was different from what Avram was beginning to lean into. 
He had a different way of connecting with God and engaging God. And so even in the Near East, gods were not concerned with the things that we've come to know from Yahweh. And so when Yahweh told Avram to leave, he was saying, I need you, one, to leave your country, which meant I need you to leave your comfort, your allegiance, your gods. I need you to leave your people, which meant I need you to leave relationships and your security blanket. And then he says, I need you to leave your father's household. In a patriarchal society, that meant you needed to leave what you would get as an inheritance. You needed to leave your way of knowing. You needed to leave your way of doing. And so God was telling Avram, I want you to risk it all in order to exercise audacious hope. You see, in our movie, Pursuit of Happiness, Chris was all about risk. I mean, he was playing Russian roulette with the IRS. He was collecting parking tickets on his windshield and selling overpriced medical equipment. But one risk that changed everything was when he decided to chase after an internship at a brokerage firm, all because he saw a future that looked drastically different from his present. And so we're going to take a moment to look at that clip. I got two questions for you. What do you do and how do you do it? <laughs> I'm a stockbroker. Stockbroker? Oh, shit. Had to go to college to be a stockbroker, huh? You don't have to. Had to be good with numbers and good with people. That's it. Hey, you take care. Hey, I'm gonna let you hang on to my car for the weekend, but I need it back for Monday. Feed the meter. <laughs> Still remember that moment. <sighs> I love that clip in the movie because you see, Chris and Avram had something in common. They didn't know what the future would hold, but they knew that in order to step into that hopeful future, what they did and who they did it with had to change. And so my question for you all this morning is, what are the things that God is requiring you to risk in order to move with audacious hope? Is it one of the things that God required of Avram? Is it your comfort and familiarity? Is it your people? <laughs> Are there people you know aren't good for you, but you don't know how you'll be perceived if you leave? Is it your family? It could, it could be your literal family or it could be your way of knowing things. It could be the way your family socialized you to believe things. Things that aren't conducive to growth or, or even your family could be those generational curses that keep showing up over and over and over again in your lineage. No matter what it is, the question becomes, what is God requiring you to risk in hope? You see, in the midst of the promise that God gave Avram, one was that he would become a great nation, that his descendants would be greater than the number of the stars. And I imagine that meant that Avram had to start believing that he could be different from his father. His father was an idolater, a wanderer, a man without vision. And the truth is that every man who becomes a father has to make a decision to risk. You know, in his book, Audacity of Hope, Barack Obama says this. Every man is trying to live up to his father's expectations or make up for their father's mistakes. You see, whether it's Avram in our text, Chris in the movie, ourselves or our fathers and father figures, this statement means something. I mean, when I think about my dad, I think about a man who had to risk being different. Throughout my life, I heard about my grandfather, his father, in ways that he sometimes fell short. But when I reflect on who my dad has been in my life, I see a man who has always worked to provide for me and my brother physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. You know, I mean, even to this day, my dad would move heaven and earth for me and my brother, and for that I'm grateful because it informs how I connect with my son and what kind of father I am. You see, reflecting on this day, Juneteenth and Father's Day, I'm fully aware 
of how the implications of the enslavement of African people has trickled down and resulted in broken homes and generation after generation, men trying to figure out what does it mean to bring things back together. Even in the movie, Chris was determined to go beyond his limits to take care of his son because he was trying to make up for his own father's mistakes. In Avram, Chris, and ourselves, there's always the potential to choose whether the risk of going towards promise is worth it. We're inundated with all the reasons why following God's desire for us and trusting God wouldn't work. I mean, Scripture tells us that unless the Lord builds it, the builders labor in vain. I mean, just in Genesis 11, one chapter before we read, we we saw the people trying to build the Tower of Babel, and it was a vain pursuit. And so we recognize that vain pursuit gets us nowhere. So why do we still insist on doing things our own way? What if instead of staying bound to the way the world says we should become great, we leaned into God? You know, if this is too abstract for you, let me break it down like this. God is saying to you as you watch this, go. Leave the group of friends that has been doing the same thing over and over again, getting nowhere, and start opening your Bible. But the question becomes, where am I going? God will leave you. Or God is saying, go. I need you to share the gospel with that person. And your response is, I don't know enough. But God is saying, I will show you. You see, in our day, Anxiety is too loud for too many of us. We're robbed of the present and paralyzed by the potential of defeat. But the truth is that hope and anxiety both reside in the future. However, one of them robs you of the beauty of today. I'm going to say that for you one more time. Hope and anxiety both reside in the future. However, one of them robs you of the beauty of today. You see, audacious hope allows you to say, despite the odds, despite the circumstances that are available to my senses, I'm choosing to believe that there's something better. But that doesn't mean that along the journey, you won't face some resistance. You start with the risk, but you will be faced with resistance. And that's my second point, resistance. You see, when you think about resistance, what areas of life do you seem to struggle the most when resistance shows up, when adversity comes knocking on your door. For me, if I can be a little, little transparent with y'all, the times when I struggle the most is usually when it comes to money. When I feel like I hit a wall financially, I struggle. And I'm probably not the only one as gas prices skyrocket, wages stagnate, houses, housing costs surge, and it has to go back to God. You see, in our text, God made several promises. God says, I will guide you. I will make your name great. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. I will give this land to your offspring. You know what promises God didn't give? I promise this will be easy. I wish that that was in there somewhere right between I will curse those who curse you and I'll give you land. I wish God said, I'll make sure it's easy. But you see, that wasn't one of the promises. You know, as a black father in this country, I've had to embrace that this life won't be easy. I've had to communicate to my son who is black and Mexican that there are people who do not like him simply because of his dual heritage. Realities he's had to face and ask me questions about. I've had to break down crying in front of my son while trying to comfort him in the wake of killings of men that look like him. So that so when this scene, the scene we're about to watch came on, it really hit me. I cry almost every time I see it because it reminds me that resistance always takes place between risk and reward. Let's look at the clip. Here it is. Here's a cake. Come on. Right here, right here. Go, go, go. Get it, get it. Hurry, hurry. Hurry. Are we safe? Yeah, I think so.
Man. That gets me every time. You know, Avram faced some resistance in his story. He faced famine. He faced familial disputes. He faced frustrating circumstances. He even faced the consequences of his own finessing. And yet, through it all, God never retracted the promise. Despite how he struggled, despite how many ways he faltered, despite how many times he took his eye off of what God had promised, God never retracted the promise. Isn't it beautiful that God doesn't renege on promises to us? You know, if you're watching and you're unclear on where you stand with God, I want you to know two things. God is the father that pursues you relentlessly and God wants to free you from bondage you've become too accustomed to. See, if you're a disciple of Jesus, I want to remind you that God didn't promise you you wouldn't face resistance in the form of doubt, fear, frustration, insecurity. But God did promise the good shepherd and a comforter. You see, from the highest highs to the lowest lows, our audacious hope is fueled by taking risk, strengthened in resistance, but ultimately is clarified in the reward. And that's my final point today. Reward. So we have risk. We have resistance. And we have reward. Let's go to Romans chapter four. 18 through 21 to close us out. Romans 4, 18 through 21. And it says this, hoping against hope. He believed that he would become the father of many nations according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what God had promised. You know, the initial promise to Avram was when he was 75. And I believe the scriptures give us some numbers so that we can try to wrap our minds around the context, try to make some sense of this. God made a promise to a man who, in our estimation, was already old, 75. And for 25 years, we had to he had to make decisions to go back to what did God promise me again? What did God say again? In the face of the famine and when he went off and, 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 and Avram struggled with lying. He struggled with, with disputing with his nephew. He struggled with how would he lead his family. He struggled in so many ways and he faltered and he failed and he blew it. And yet somehow he still was able to come back to the promise. You know, I think about our movie Pursuit of Happiness and I don't quite understand or know what Chris Gardner was feeling or thinking as he had to wrestle with, I'm determined to hold on to my son despite the odds. I'm determined to study this book that I have to learn from. I'm determined to make these sales. I'm determined to do all the things I have to do because all I can see is the promise of a better future. Y'all, in many ways, we don't get to the reward without strengthening the muscles that are necessary for us to grow. You know, we often want the reward, but we don't want the risk. We often want the reward, but we don't want the resistance. I mean, oftentimes we, we wait a few minutes and we get frustrated. We wait a few days and we get frustrated. We may wait a few months or a few years, but what happens when we put it in perspective and recognize that Avram waited 25 years? 25 years of every day saying, is this the day, God? 25 years of saying, God, I heard what you promised me, but I'm, is that what, what exactly did you mean? 25 years of simply saying, God, 
Just help me today. You know, that's that's what all of us have to come to at some point. If we are striving to look like Jesus, if we're striving to to make it to the promise of heaven, we have to fight to say, God, today I need your strength. I can't do it on my own. God, today, if I'm going to see your reward, I need the strength that you give. You know, I I don't know where you are in this journey as we are trying to make sense of what's next. And I think we would do well, no matter where we are in life, no matter what area we are in our relationship with God, no matter what we're going through, no matter how many times we've blown it, we have to go back to God. You never told me where I was going. You never told me how the promise would play out. You never told me what would come of this. All you told me was that you will show me. And so in our prayers, in our lives, in our day to day, moving through this journey, we have to simply say, God, show me today. Open the door today. Guide my path today. Help me fight today. Because I truly believe that as we put one foot in front of the other, when we take risk, if we put one foot in front of the other as we overcome resistance, when we put one foot in front of the other, before we know it, we'll look up and say, wow, that was a full life. But I see the reward. You know, as you're here, if you don't know where to start to begin to hear promises from God, I want to encourage you. Take some time. Reach out to us. We want to sit down and open the scriptures with you. But we don't only want to open the scriptures with you. We want to share our lives as well. You know, I think about how I got here and it was through and has been through and continues to be through the faith of some of my fathers in the faith. Seeing the resilience of men who have walked with Jesus imperfectly for 20, 30, 40 years. And it reminds me that if we keep going, we will reap a reward if we do not give up. And so lean in, lean in to the way that God is trying to show you promises from the scriptures Lean in to the people that God is putting in your path and recognize that this may be a time where you have to leave those things that are comfortable. Leave those idols. Leave the things that bring you a little bit of joy so that you can find the ultimate joy. You know, as I close, I think about this last scene in the movie. Chris, through the months of toil, through the many nights in the homeless shelter, through losing money and not knowing what he would feed his son and how he would make sure he and his son were able to thrive, he finally was given the job. Check it out. Welcome. Was it as easy as it looked? No, sir. No, no, sir, it wasn't. Good luck, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Oh, Chris. I almost forgot. This part of my life, this little part, is called happiness.
I'm glad we're able to close with that scene because the hope, the audacious hope, the hope against all odds is that we will make it to heaven one day. And just as Chris was in tears, overwhelmed with joy, reminded of the struggle, I believe that's going to be us as we see Jesus. We'll be reminded that the waiting no longer matters. We'll be reminded that there was a father who loved us and loved us so much that he wanted to reach down into our struggle and pull us up. And so as we take communion, I want us to be reminded that God, our Father, is unlike any father we've ever known. God, our Father, is not the Father that would leave us or forsake us, is not the Father that would abandon us, not the Father that expects perfection from us. I don't know who needs to hear that. I don't know who has to embrace that reality. God, our Father, does not need perfection. God, our Father, needs us to just keep walking towards audacious hope. So as we eat the bread, the cracker that represents Jesus' body, and we drink the juice that represents Jesus' blood, I want us to be reminded that that was for us so we could get the ultimate reward. Let us pray. God, we thank you. You're the God that loves. You're the God that gives. You're the God that cares. And so, God, even now on this day, Father's Day, there are likely multiple perspectives and experiences that make this day a bag of mixed emotions. And so even when we say, God, the Father, help us to override our human perspectives of flawed fathers and help us to engage you as the father that wants to wrap us in love, in compassion, in forgiveness, in joy, in truth, in light. And God, help us remember that you have shown us your beauty through your son, Jesus. As we take this communion, help us be reminded that this is not just an act that we do, but it is to bring us back to the reminder of why we take the risk to leave everything behind. We, we navigate through resistance to overcome and be reminded of the beautiful reward ahead. We love you. We praise in your son Jesus' name. Amen.
Hey, y'all. <laughs> I'm grateful. And I'm definitely hoping you'll join us again. But if you're watching, I want to invite you to join us in person. <laughs> when we're able to be together, please take some time to just come join us. It's nothing like being around other people. But if you're on the virtual path and you're not in Atlanta, we want to continue to love you, serve you. And so make contact. Join one of our small groups so we can continue to love God together. Yeah.